I'm excited for us to get back into our study of the book of Luke. Last week, we talked about Jesus' authority to challenge. He claimed to be the Son of Man in reference to being the Messiah. And ultimately, it was clear to all around him that he claimed to be the very Son of God by his ability to forgive sins. We concluded at the end of Luke chapter 5, and I'd like for us to go back there so we can have kind of a, a running start, so to speak, into chapter 6. At the end of Luke 5, Jesus shares three parables that are kind of melded into one teaching. In verse 36, he says, He told them this parable. No one tears a patch from a new garment and sews it on an old one. If he does, he will have torn a new garment, and the patch for the new will not match the old. And no one pours new wine into old wineskins. If he does, the new wine will burst the skins, the wine will run out, and the wineskins will be ruined. No, new wine must be poured into new wineskins. And no one after drinking old wine wants the new, for he says, the old is better. Right here, Jesus lays it out. He compares Judaism to be an utterly worn out wineskin. That it's lost its purposefulness. He says, I'm not about trying to patch up something that's utterly decimated. That's the first parable. Taking a piece of the new cloth and patching it on the old. He says, after all, you'd ruin the whole new cloth. The second one, he says, hey, you don't pour new wine into old wineskins. You'd ruin both the wine and the wineskin. No, you pour new wine into new wineskins. And he was signaling his new movement and the birth of a spiritual Israel. Then the last one throws people in verse 39. It says, and no one after drinking old wine wants the new, for he says the old is better. There were many at that time who couldn't accept the teachings of the new wine because they simply thought in their minds that the old was better and they wouldn't even venture to check out the new wine of Jesus. And so the title of our lesson today is simply this, New Wine in the New Wineskins. And chapter 6 is all about Jesus shaking up the establishment with the establishment of a new kingdom. Let's go to chapter 6, verse 1. Our first point is serious controversy. That's what happens when you pour new wine into old wineskins. Verse 1. One Sabbath, Jesus was going through the grain fields, and his disciples began to pick some heads of grain, rub them in their hands, and eat the kernels. Some of the Pharisees asked, Why are you doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath? She sent them, Have you never read what David did when he and his companions were hungry? He entered the house of God and taking the consecrated bread, he ate what is lawful only for the priests to eat. And he also gave some to his companions. Then Jesus said to them, The Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Right here, Jesus is forcing the issue. He says, You've got to make a decision about me. Am I the Son of God? Am I the Son of Man? Or am I just some radical that's going after upsetting the law. Wow. Right here, we find a seemingly innocent situation. I mean, after all, according to Deuteronomy chapter 23 and verse 25, any person could go into a grain field and if they were hungry, simply pick the grain, kind of rub it in their hands, get the chaff off of it, let it kind of blow in the air, and then eat the kernels of grain. This was something that the Bible said was just fine. The problem is is that over time, the Pharisees and scribes had begun to be very specific and write things in about how to keep the Sabbath that were traditions and not in the Word of God. And so consequently, when the Pharisees saw Jesus and his disciples going to the grain fields, they saw a quadruple violation of the law in their minds. First of all, they saw them reaping. And you can't reap on the Sabbath. 
They saw them threshing. And you can't thresh on the Sabbath. They saw them winnowing. What's winnowing? Well, that's when you throw the kernel up in the air and the chaff blows away. And they were preparing food. And you weren't allowed to prepare food on the Sabbath. And so they said, wow, look at what you've done. Of course, Jesus takes a stand and he answers their question with a question. And he says, have you never read what David did? Now, right here is a very powerful point that Jesus is about to drive on home. But most importantly, he's trying to get them to see from Scripture the error of their ways. And he refers back to the account in 1 Samuel chapter 21 where David was hungry and we find by inference that there were other guys with him. And he goes to the high priest there at Nob. And he says, hey, I'm hungry. Do you have some food? He says, we have no food but the showbread, the bread for the priests. And he says, but I'm hungry. Please give me that. And so the priest gives David five loaves, enough for him and his companions. And so Jesus is trying to get the Pharisees to see the errors of their way. Their laws had made the Sabbath a day of bondage instead of a day of blessing. The Sabbath was supposed to be like a vacation day. Aren't you fired up about your vacation? Yeah. And Jesus is saying, hey, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. And he lays it out. He says, you can't have a mindset of, is it lawful, but is it loving? God is concerned about meeting the needs of mankind. Now, it's a very interesting principle. It's called the showbread principle that comes through right here. In other words, not all scripture applies in every situation. Jesus is saying that the law of love reigns supreme in the new kingdom with the new wine. Are you with me right here? And so Jesus comes on back at the very end and he says in verse 5, the son of man is Lord of the Sabbath. Once more, he's challenging them. Do you believe that I am the Son of God. Now, look what happens next. Remember, serious controversy. On another Sabbath, he went into the synagogue and was teaching, and a man was there whose right hand was shriveled. The Pharisees and teachers of the law were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus, so they watched him closely to see if he would heal on the Sabbath. But Jesus knew what they were thinking and said to the man with the shriveled hand, Get up, stand up in front of everyone. So he got up and stood there. Then Jesus said to them, I ask you, which is lawful on the Sabbath, to do good or to do evil, to save life or to destroy it? He looked around at them all, and then he said to the man, stretch out your hand. He did so, and his hand was completely restored. Remember now, Luke's a doctor. He's really fired up about this miracle. <laughs> but they were furious, and they began to discuss with one another what they might do to Jesus. You know, Jesus loved Saturdays. <laughs> it was the Sabbath. And he knew the mindset of the Pharisees was such that they were actually destroying what God's intent was for the Sabbath. And so Jesus purposely waited until the Sabbath to be able to do so many of his miracles because he went after controversy. How so different than a lot of us? We want to avoid controversy. Jesus created controversy. He wanted people to think. And right here, for many of us, we wouldn't quite catch all the intent of Luke the physician and the evangelist. At this time, the, quote, Pharisaic law said that on the Sabbath, a doctor could indeed Heal if, number one, life was in danger. Number two, a baby was to be born. Or number three, circumcision had to be done on the eighth day. Other than that, they weren't allowed to heal. That would be work. Of course, the ironic thing, the whole thing, is all Jesus does is speak one sentence and the guy's healed. It's not a lot of work, but amen. <laughs> but right here... We see that Jesus makes a show of it. He literally goes on in there. He knows what all the Pharisees are thinking. And he says, hey, how about you stand up in front of everybody? The guy stands up. And of course, he has a shriveled hand. And some of the early manuscripts say that he was a stonemason who had injured his hand. But we don't know that for sure. 
But nonetheless, it wasn't a life-threatening injury. And yet Jesus comes at him and he says, Hey, which is lawful on the Sabbath, to do good or do evil, to save life or destroy it? And then they're silent. He says, stretch out his hand. The moment he stretches out his hand, it's completely restored. And you can just imagine everybody just being so fired up. But the Bible says right here in verse 11, but they were furious. The actual Greek here is an interesting word. The Greek word is anoisis, where we get the word annoy. It actually means mindless rage and irrational anger. You see, their whole world was being turned upside down by Jesus. You know, there have even been some of us who have been taken aback by the label that we've attached ourselves to be the sold out discipling movement. See, that's controversial. Precisely. In some way, the concept of being sold out and a disciple is redundant. But just as the word Christian has kind of lost its meaning, sadly, to so many, the word disciple wow. has lost its meaning. Wow. And you got to ask yourself, why would someone be upset with the call to be a sold out disciple? A disciple disciple. <laughs> it's because they're not one. Come on. Stop Jesus intentionally went after controversy to make people think. You know, last, last Sunday was truly glorious with all the baptisms. Amen? Yeah. And each soul is certainly beloved of God. And the one that really touched me so much was, was Terrence's baptism. Yeah. And you know, it only took him 11 short months to be able to make that decision. Yeah. Terrence was actually at our inaugural yeah. service last May. Yeah, <laughs> And you know something? He'd study, he'd get in there, and he'd say, well, maybe I want to be baptized, all this. But you know, the, the brothers, they had him in the Word, and they kept challenging, you got to be a sold-out disciple. If Jesus gave us blood, we cannot have the acceptance of cheap grace in the church. They said, no, you've got to repent of your smoking. As difficult as this, you've got to deal with your life. You've got to get married to Elaine. I realize that in the eyes of law, you have a common law marriage, but you've got to do it right. Well, you know, after studying the Bible for almost 11 months, he made his decision to be a sold-out disciple. And then today, you see the first fruits of that when Elaine, his wife, is restored to Jesus Christ. You see, as disciples, we cannot... Be afraid of controversy. Controversy was of Jesus. It's what his ministry was all about. It brought attention to the God that produced these miracles. Are you with me right here? Let's get back to the text. Our second point is decisions on high. Verse 12. One of those days. You ever had one of those days? Maybe today is one of those days. Well, the, the Bible talks about one of those days. It says, one of those days, Jesus went out to the mountainside to pray and spent the night praying to God. Right here, Luke is showing that Jesus is totally God, but totally human, and he needs God to sustain him. Yeah. It's the only time in all scripture that he prays all the way through the night, so Luke is underlining the fact that this is a gigantic decision that he's wrestling with. When the morning came, he called his disciples to him and chose 12 of them, whom he also designated apostles. Simon, whom he named Peter, his brother Andrew, James, John, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, son of Alphaeus, Simon, who's called the Zealot, Judas, son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who became a traitor. Now right here, it is interesting to note that this is only one of four lists of the apostles. Luke has two of them. The other list is in the first chapter of Acts. The only difference in the two lists is a very interesting one is that the names are the same, the order is slightly different, because in the book of Acts, he has the pairing of the apostles. Because Jesus always sent people out two by two. Amen, guys? Well, right here, we find two very important aspects that I think we need to focus our attention on. Number one, Jesus wanted a clear signal about a new kingdom. 
The old kingdom, a physical kingdom, the nation of Israel, was based on the 12 sons of Jacob. The 12 sons of Israel. Now he says, we're not going to do that anymore. I am picking from all of the disciples that I've made over the past year or so, 12 who will be with me. Now that number was so significant to the Jew. It represented a new kingdom with new wine. Secondly, Jesus was focusing on a few. He realized that if he was going to change the world, it wasn't by just incredible sermons. He would have to change the world by pouring his life into a few men who would in turn pour their lives into a few other men who would then in turn pour their lives into still others and thus multiply the message into the four corners of the globe. Amen. You know, as we wrestle with this passage, this is the one that really, I think, comes back strong to us. You know, it's really awesome. Raja flew on in on Wednesday and so Thursday... I invited Raja to go with me up to Mount Hollywood where I always go to, to pray. Amen. And all the big significant decisions in my life for the last 16 years, I've always gone up there to speak with the Lord and to wrestle with God. And it's always fun for me to take up a group or take up other people up on my prayer mountain. And so that's exactly, it was so much fun just talking with Raja all the way up. Now I was huffing and puffing a little bit more than Raja was. <laughs> when we got up there, you know, it's just, it's just an amazing scene, the challenge and the vision of evangelizing Los Angeles. And yet, in the midst of all that, we talked about America with 300 million and India having over 1 billion lost souls. And yet, Jesus wants all these people to have a chance to hear. And I talked to Raja. I said, Raja, you know, we've got to do it Jesus' way. We've got to have Jesus' plan to evangelize all of India. I think it's great, these little remnant groups that have come out in Mumbai and Bangalore and Chennai and uh, perhaps another one will be coming out in Hyderabad. I, I, I don't know. That's not how we're going to do it. You need to call a few men to yours and Debbie's side and they need to walk with you in a powerful way that they have the same commitment that Jesus has and you pass that commitment into them and then they are sent out into the four corners of India and then India will hear the word. Yeah. Well, it was really awesome. We had, a, we had a prayer right at the fence at the top and I prayed. But I, I was so moved by Raja. He, he gets up there and he starts crying. Not just his eyes were a little wet. I mean, I looked down and the fence was just wet with his tears. That's how much of a burden he felt for all of our hurting brothers and sisters in India as well as for all the lost souls right there. You know, I think for all of us, we've got to really wrestle with what is the focus of your life? Does your life even have a focus? Is the focus of your life Jesus and his mission? For some of us, we're so busy, we don't have a focus. And that's the fact. You are too busy. And you need to repent. For others, we've spread ourselves out in good-heartedness, trying to help all these people on out. And we've deserted the plan of Jesus, which is to focus in on a few. You should be focusing on a few people you're trying to disciple. So you can have a maximum impact, as well as having the time to reach out to non-Christians and baptize them. You know, the bottom line is, for many of us, our busyness with church affairs is stopping us from being effective in the mission and the ministry of Jesus Christ. Today, today, we need to make some decisions about how we spend our time and how we focus our time if we really want to change the world. Changing the world is not just some airy-fairy dream. Changing the world involves you investing your heart, soul, mind, and strength into another man who in turn grabs the dream of Jesus with the same level of passion to the point of death so that this world can be evangelized 
And it will only be done through the plan of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Point three. Jesus shares an upside-down theology. Remember, he's pouring new wine into new wineskins. Now, this is really awesome how, how, how Luke writes this. Verse 17. He went down with them, talking about the twelve, and stood on a level place. Now, we're going to talk about that in a second. A large crowd of his disciples was there, and a great number of people from all over Judea, from Jerusalem, and from the coast of Tyre and Sidon, who had come to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. Those troubled by evil spirits were cured, and the people all tried to touch him, because power was coming from him and healing them all. Wow, this is just so rich. Right here, Jesus is about to go into what we call the Beatitudes. In the book of Matthew, it's called the Sermon on the Mount. Right here, if you'll notice, he comes down from the mountain onto the plain. Now, there's a couple things happening. Number one, Luke wanted to emphasize that Jesus went up to the mountain to pray to God. Now, who else went up to the mountain? Moses, right? And when Moses came down, what did he have? The Ten Commandments, the new law. Now Jesus, in the way that Luke's writing this, has gone up to the mountain, and now he's coming down with an upside-down theology, the new law. Are you with me right here? So he talks about a plain. The word plain here can mean plateau. So he's come down partially from the mountain, and he's on a plateau. So in effect, it is the same place that Matthew talked about. Now, secondly, we see three groups of people. His disciples... And then get this, a large crowd of his disciples. So we get the apostles and a large crowd of his disciples. And then a great number of people. Well, from where? All the way from Judea. There's the emphasis of Jerusalem again. And then look at this, from the coast of Tyre and Sidon. Gentiles. I mean, Jesus was having such an impact. Not only were the Jews coming to hear this itinerant preacher, but even Gentiles were coming from foreign lands to hear about this controversial Jesus. Very interesting. Newt notes, they'd all come to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. And then that says, power was coming out of him and healing them all. What Luke is trying to convey here is a very simple thing. He said, it doesn't matter if you're Jew or Gentile, Close or far, Jesus can sozo you, can heal you, he can save you. Are you with me right here? Now, as we read this next section, you're going to find that these Beatitudes are a little bit differently listed than the ones in Matthew. Now, both Matthew and Luke take some liberty as they record the sermon of Jesus. For example, um... A few weeks ago, I gave the lesson right here in Luke chapter 4. Then a few days later, I gave Luke chapter 4 the same lesson in Washington, D.C. I kept essentially the same points, but I changed things around a little bit. And so right here, Luke and Matthew have taken the liberty to draw upon Jesus' other sermon. I mean, this is, Jesus didn't just preach his sermons one time, guys. He preached them over and over again so people would know them and memorize them. Amen? Now, let's look at this upside down. Theology. All right, come on, Verse 20. Looking at his disciples, he said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Amen. Blessed are you who hunger now, for you'll be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when men hate you, when they exclude you and insult you and reject your name as evil because of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, because great is your reward in heaven. For that is how their fathers treated the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you have already received your comfort. Woe to you who are well fed now, for you'll go hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you will mourn and weep. Woe to you when all men speak well of you, for that is how their fathers treated the false prophets. Woo! Jesus lays it out right here. Notice the reversing of values, turning things upside down. He starts out, blessed are you who are Poor, and get this, it's in the present tense. For yours is the kingdom of God. Is that awesome? 
Yeah. And then he says, blessed are you who hunger now. That's part of being poor. He says, now you're hungry, but because of your faith, you're going to be satisfied. And he says, bless you who weep now. Well, that's because you're poor and you're hungry. Now you're weeping. And that's what it's about being in a recession sometimes. You know what I'm talking about right here? And then he lays out, he says, blessed are you when men hate you, exclude you, insult you, reject you. These are all in contrast. The poor to the rich, the hungry to the well-fed, the weeping to the laughing. Now, some people don't quite understand that. Laughing, for a lot of people, signifies being kind of self-satisfied or condescending. You know, kind of have a condescending laugh. <laughs> <laughs> or simply rejoicing at the harm of others. But in Jewish literature, the last is always that which is emphasized and magnified by its length. And so Jesus lays it out. Blessed are you when men hate you, exclude you, insult you, and reject you. He says, that's how they treat it. The prophets. He says, woe to you when all men speak well of you. Well, there's a way for people to speak well of you. Number one, you don't say anything. You never say anything to anybody. You don't share your faith. And there's another thing. There's another way for people to really like you. Tell them what they want to hear. You're awesome. You're great. You have no problems. You have no sins you need to worry about. You're fine with God. Everybody goes, oh man, I really like this guy. Yeah. You know, I figured it out. Persecution has two elements to it. Life and doctrine. <laughs> when we challenge people about their life, if they're soft-hearted, they respond. But if they're not, when that light comes in the darkness, it makes them angry. It does. We challenge people about their doctrine. We say, hey, you got to have faith, repent, be baptized. And someone perhaps has a background of tradition, like being baptized as a baby or just simply praying Jesus in your heart. They're ticked off. They're defensive. That's where persecution comes from, from life and from doctrine. You see, if you don't want to be persecuted, then don't preach. Wow. You know, I thought about this passage, and it's been great for me to wrestle with some of these scriptures. And when I looked about what it, what it really meant to be a follower of God, to have people hate you, exclude you, insult you, and reject you, I actually felt pretty good. <laughs> I've been disfellowshipped by the mainline church and disfellowshipped by our former fellowship. That's, that sounds pretty much like hate, insult, exclude. <laughs> they wanted to kill Jesus. When I came here to L.A., there were death threats. Yeah. Even when Kathy was with us when we traveled, there were death threats in places like Cairo and Moscow. And then when I kind of stepped out of the limelight and wasn't really preaching the word, there were no more death threats. <laughs> then the moment I came back to L.A., one of the first devotionals here, Ron remembers, oh, yeah. I had death threats. I go, amen, I'm back. <laughs> See, when you challenge the establishment, there's going to be a backlash. Now, one of the things I, I still remember, though, was when I was a baby Christian, the cost for me was simply standing up and sharing my faith at my fraternity house, which basically was a den of iniquity. But I wanted everybody to like me. But you know something? I got there, and it was amazing. I started sharing my faith, and to my surprise, when I shared my faith, yeah, there was some negative backlash, but two weeks after I was baptized, a guy named Terry was baptized. A week after that, a friend of mine named Randy was baptized. A week after that, a friend of mine named Chip was baptized. Then I went home for the summer, not much action. I came on back in the fall, and my roommate Mike was baptized. Then my little brother fraternity, Kevin, was baptized. And then this one guy that came to my Bible talk drunk one time, Bill, got baptized. Now when Bill got baptized, heck broke loose at the fraternity house. And I got called in. He says, listen, Kip, 
We have to talk to you because it may be time to kick you out of the fraternity. First of all, you got your priorities wrong. <laughs> says, we have chapter meeting on Wednesday night and you're going to that church. These were the top guns in the fraternity. These were the officers. And then one of them, who was just particularly spiteful, his name was Roger. <laughs> he goes, he says, I am so upset about what you're doing. He says, every week on Monday night, right before your Bible study, you go, come to Bible talk. <laughs> he just exaggerates it, you know. <laughs> and I'm getting ticked. I, I've stopped being intimidated. I am ticked off. <laughs> then he goes, and then every weekend, come to church. <laughs> and you know, you're sitting there and you're getting very mad. And then it just hit me. I said, well, Roger, what's the difference? Every weekend you're going, come to the ABC Liquor Lounge. <laughs> Come to Dub's bar. The other officers are rolling over laughing. They're going, hey, Roger, he's got you there, doesn't he? You know? <laughs> so the president goes, okay, Kip, that's it. We're done. Get out of here. <laughs> Three weeks later, I was elected Tribune of Fraternity. <laughs> Let me tell you something. If you're going to have an impact, you're going to be hated. You're going to be insulted. And you're going to be persecuted. But look at this theme that Luke keeps on having. Verse 23. Rejoice in that day. Well, how much? And leap for joy. Why? Because great is your reward in heaven. I want you guys to stand up for a second. Just stand on up for a second. We need to get fired up about being in a controversial church that's preaching the word of God. It says, it says, when you are persecuted, you need to leap for joy. Yeah. On the count of three, let's do that. One, two, three. Yeah. Amen. Let me see this. You got to admit, you feel a lot better now, don't you? Amen. Nothing like leaping for joy when you get a little persecution. <laughs> Let's delve some more into this upside-down theology. Verse 27. He continues to talk about those who persecute. He says, but I tell you who hear me, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. And pray for those who mistreat you. Why? You want to baptize them. If someone strikes you on one cheek, turn to him the other also. He's talking about your face there. Okay. <laughs> if someone takes your cloak do not stop him from taking your turning not for me that would be okay if someone takes my cloak my jacket say hey take my shirt too <laughs> the idea is someone's robbing you right here don't resist say hey you want my jacket you like that hey take my shirt hey you want to come to my church <laughs> Give to everyone who asks you, and if anyone takes what belongs to you, do not demand it back. Do to others as you would have them do to you. The golden rule. Yes. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who are good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. And if you lend to those from whom you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners expecting to be repaid in full. But love your enemies... Do good to them and lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great. And you will be the sons of the Most High. Because he is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. Wow. Be merciful as your father is merciful. Jesus upside down theology. He says you've got to be like God. And the problem with the Pharisees is they didn't see God right. And when you don't see God right, you're not going to live right. The God of Jesus is a merciful God. He is a God that loved us when we were ungrateful and loved us when we were wicked. Because that's the kind of love you have. You know, it's challenging sometimes to love those who oppose you, but the rewards are great. I shared, I believe, last week the, the, the story of, of Hilo with uh, Kyle. 
And in time, Kyle's coming. Very interestingly, that particular weekend, there were three individuals that came from Honolulu wanting to start a new church. One couple was Joe and Mary Santos. I think it's kind of cool. Joseph and Mary. Amen. <laughs> and then a, a, a man named Chris Tevis. Both Joseph and Mary and Chris had all been in the ministry. But through all the challenges, had left the ministry. They all talked to me. Hey, we want to start a new church. We want to have a church where Jesus is Lord, where there's discipling, where we have a worldwide vision to evangelize the world in this generation. I said, I'm behind you. Well, they went on over to start the church. And after the first Sunday, Chris's wife just gave him heck. And he backed out. Not only did he back out, but he went around the Hawaiian Islands and even here in Los Angeles saying very bad things about me. <laughs> I didn't say anything about him. Time passed. Matter of fact, about, about a year and a half. And uh, about three weeks ago, I get a phone call from a brother informing me. He says, you won't believe who came to church. I said, who? Chris Tevis. I said, what happened? Well, he said that he was just heading to the old fellowship. And he goes, you know something? What am I doing? I'm, I'm going to a place I know is dead, doesn't have discipling, doesn't believe what I believe. He literally made a U-turn and headed for the new church. Today, Chris is a part of that new church and is anxiously awaiting the Honolulu mission team. Are you with me right here? You see, if you retaliate, you're going to put up walls between people. I can't talk about that. You, you can't respond in kind. Jesus never reacted. He acted. Right. And he loved even when people were ungrateful and wicked. Why? Because he wanted to win, win them to his cause. Now that's upside down theology. Are you with me right there? Let's keep moving. Our fourth point is kingdom principles. Jesus throws out a lot of them quickly right here. Verse 37. Do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, will be poured into your lap. For the measure you use will be the measure to you. He also told him this parable. Can a blind man lead a blind man? Well, they not both fall into the pit. A student's not above a teacher, but everyone who is fully trained will be like his teacher. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, Brother, let me take that speck out of your eye, when you yourself fail to see the plank in your own eye? You hypocrite! First take the plank out of your eye, and then you'll see clearly enough to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Now, there's a lot right here. And we can't get into it all. But one of the things that I want to make sure that we understand from a biblical perspective is the issue of judgment. Jesus is not saying not to judge people right here. No. He's saying not to have hypocritical judgment and to realize that the measure you use in judging people is going to be the same measure back on you. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. There are a lot of people today who don't want to have discipling in their lives because they say, oh, don't judge me. No, 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 no. The Bible's pretty clear about stuff right here. There are some problems in the church at Corinth, and Paul writes in verse 6 of chapter 5, your boasting's not good. Don't you know that a little yeast works through the whole batch of dough? Get rid of the old yeast that you may have a new batch without yeast as you really are. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us keep the festival, not with the old yeast, the yeast of malice and wickedness, but with bread without yeast, the bread of sincerity and truth. He says, keep the body pure. Now look at this. I have written you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people. Not all mean the people of this world who are immoral or the greedy and swindlers or idolaters. In that case, you'd have to leave the world. Amen, guys? But now I'm writing you that you must not associate with anyone who calls himself a brother. But is sexually immoral, greedy, an idolater, a slanderer, a drunkard, or a swindler. With such a man, do not even eat. What business is a mind to judge those outside the church? Are you not to judge those inside? God will judge those outside. Expel the wicked man from among you. Paul was hard lying. He says we have a responsibility to be our brother's keeper. Now, 
we can't be hypocritical in our judgment and say, my brother, I believe you've got a little speck in your eye. You were, I think, five minutes late for church. And you got this two by four of uncommitment hanging out of your eye. But we need to be clear. This is God's church, but it's our church. And God expects us to take care of it. Not with mean, harsh, critical judgment. But with concerning mercy for one another. Where we can genuinely in love confront one another with the things that are not of Christ. That way the body stays pure and faithful. Are you with me right here? And he says, then you, you, you need to have this, this spirit of mercy. And he says, forgive and you'll be forgiven. Then this next is, is really awesome. Give and it'll be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, and it'll be poured in your lap. For if the measure you use will be the measure to you. He's talking about the blessings of God right here. And since most of us don't work on the farm, at least we can sort of relate to this passage from a box of cereal, okay? You know how sometimes you open your box of cereal and it's only three quarters full? You go, where'd the rest of that go right there? They gypped me, you know? No, 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 no. See, in the shaking of the box, the grains, the flakes start to settle. And there's less. And you start shaking a little bit more and it settles down even more. God says, he says, I want to bless you so much. I, I, I want to shake up your life so it goes down. Then I want to pour some more blessings on in. And then I want to press it down. You know, you press down those weedies so you get the most you can. <laughs> then you keep pouring more on top to where finally the whole box just overflows. There just is no more blessings can fit. See, that's what God wants to do for us. Is that exciting or not, church? You know, it's interesting right here. He says, can a blind man lead a blind man? And the answer is what? Unfortunately, the answer needs to be no. (laughs) But a lot of people answer yes. A blind man can lead a blind man right into a pit. And the Greek right here is a mammoth hole, not a little ditch. Students not above his teacher, but everyone who is fully trained will be like his teacher. This is discipleship. But discipleship with mercy and grace. You know, one of the real challenges, I think, came in the earlier passage in connection to this. It talks about if we love only those people who love us, what reward have you? I mean, even the sinners do that. You know, one of the great challenges of discipleship is that through a series of circumstances, you may be discipled by or discipling a person that's super different than you. And you go, hey, we have nothing in common. Yes, you do. You have Jesus Christ. And I always believe that God puts the right people into our lives at the right time. You know what I'm talking about right here? You know, I'll I'll never forget talking with uh, a, a sister that uh, Elaine and I love very much, Sonia Klopek. About two years ago, we were out to lunch with uh, uh, her husband and her. They were visiting Portland. And uh, we said, well, Sonia, how's it coming? Oh, the church in Phoenix is doing great. Uh, Matt and Helen have come with the mission team from Portland. They're doing a really an awesome job. And Elaine, I think, went and goes, well, well, how's your relationship with Helen? And she goes, well, we're friends. So, and Elaine goes, well, what do you mean? Well, you know, we're just really different. And if you know Helen and Sonia, from a worldly point of view, they are really, really different. <laughs> Sonia is this girly girl, you know, the, the kind that, you know, likes all the nice clothes and dress and dresses to the nines, you know. And Helen, her joy is to go out for a 10-mile run. <laughs> and then wear no makeup. <laughs> You know something? We just talked to them just a couple of weeks ago. And now, Sonia and Helen are best friends. And Sonia would tell her, no one has affected her life any more than Helen Sullivan. See, we've got to want the Jesus 
in each other. And we've got to be willing to submit to people that are different. That is the beauty of the body of Christ. That is the power of discipling. And when you invite these kind of people into your life and the challenges that come with them, this is what changes us to be like Jesus. Are you with me right here? These are just a few of the kingdom principles. Well, let's finish on out right here. In verse 43. No good tree bears bad fruit. Nor does a bad tree bear good fruit. Each tree is recognized by its own fruit. People do not pick figs from thorn bushes or grapes from buyers. The good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart. And the evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. For out of the overflow of his heart, his mouth speaks. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? I will show you what he is like who comes to me and hears my word and puts him into practice. He is like a man building a house who dug down deep and laid the foundation on rock. When the flood came, the torrent struck the house but could not shake it because it was well built. But the one who hears my words and doesn't put them into practice is like a man who built his house on the ground without a foundation. The moment the torrent struck the house, it collapsed and its destruction was complete. Our last point is either saved or lost. Jesus saw the world in absolutes. Not in shades of gray. To Jesus, a man's life was bad fruit or good fruit. Thorn bushes or figs. Buyers, grapes. Sand, rock. Cold, hot, darkness, light, lost, or saved. The very teaching challenges our Western thought to the core. The concept of absolute truth. He was not only calling them to truth, but to live it. He was calling people to a decision. And he says, you know where you're at. By the very things that come out of your mouth. You know, Elaine and I have a chance and a blessing to be able to help some of the brothers and sisters that struggle from time to time in their marriages. And it's not uncommon. The husband or maybe even the wife will say, well, I said that, but I didn't really mean it. I mean, I don't want a divorce. Ah, out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. You may not intellectually want it, but it's in there somewhere. Sometimes we blow off things said in anger. I don't want to go to church. Oh, it's in there. It's in there. That's what Jesus says. Out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. You know, the challenge of the second verse, or second parable is strong here, about building your house. And he's talking to those people that believed in him. He says, why do you call me Lord, Lord? But don't do what I say. Wow, is that modern day America or not? There are so many people that believe in Jesus. Call him Lord. But their lives are an absolute mess of sin. What's it take? Well, Jesus says, hey, it's only two places you can build, either on the sand or on the rock. If you're going to build on the rock, it's going to take some effort. I love that little line, verse 48, you got to dig down deep. Does that describe your Bible study as a disciple? That you're digging down deep in the Word of God? Now, there'll be some days that'll be more impacting than others, but does your quiet time excite you? Can you not, after a quiet time, can't wait to get on the phone and talk to a couple of your best friends in the church and say, bro, you won't believe 
what I just studied. If you're going to dig down deep, does that describe the guts you have in evangelism? When was the last time you had someone out for services? When was the last time you had someone out for Bible talk? You know, perhaps my dearest friend outside of my family is Nick Bordieri. Where's Nick at? There he is, amen. Second row, it's hard for me to see past. <laughs> and Nick is a man I respect. I mean, this guy, I mean, he's, he, he gave everything up to be a disciple. I mean, he had the world, and yet all the emptiness with it. Before he came in the kingdom, he and Denise were about ready to call it quits and have a divorce. But Nick and Nice both got right with God. They got saved. And their marriage got healed. Just like Luke teaches. So, but you know, entering the kingdom is always a struggle. And in his faith and gallantry to move on down here, I mean, he gave up a 20-year job at Nike. Wow. That's a cranking place to work. That's a lot of prestige. It's a lot of comfortability. He gave it all up for one reason, the mission. He came on down here. He got a job. And things didn't go so well. They went terrible. And they let him go just a couple of weeks ago. Whoa. He tried to master a house church. And he just hasn't been trained enough. I take a lot of that responsibility. And wow. But so the thing, we got together. He says, bro, can we just get together and talk? So we got together this week. And he says, he says, he says brother, I have been greatly humbled by God. I have been humbled by God. Teach me where I'm falling short. How am I messing up? I, I realize the challenges at work are also challenges in even building a house church or a Bible talk. And we just, I just laid it on out in love and mercy but I laid out the challenges that Nick had the amazing things the next day I get this email he says bro thanks that was awesome I really needed that he says I really see where and Nick goes that I really need to start sharing my faith like crazy I really see where and he just goes he just listed them these are decisions I have made and that I'm practicing how about it guys are you building on the rock or the sand? Are you digging down deep? Do you have people in your life who care enough about your soul that they value your soul more than the relationship? What's the challenge today? Well, there are going to be storms. Both the person that built on the rock and the sand had storms of life. But only one stood and Jesus was indeed pouring new wine into new wineskins. The five points are very simple. Take the S from serious controversy. The H from decisions on high. The A from an upside down theology. The K from kingdom principles. And the E from either saved or lost. You'll find the word shake. Jesus was about shaking the establishment. Shaking the religious establishment. Shaking the secular establishment. Jesus was trying to Shake up the Pharisees. He was trying to shake the disciples side by side to go out and preach the word of God. And he was trying to shake down our blessings for us here on earth. Bottom line, Jesus wanted to shake it upside down. Thanks and God bless.